today as we come to the table. God pours out his spirit on them. And they just start getting saved. They're going, you know what? I, we want to go to church. How many churches would they feel comfortable going to? Now, what if they felt comfortable coming here? I hope they would. And what if they start sitting right now in all these places where you guys are, you don't have, they're sitting right between you. You got the guy, you know, with the hair like this, you know, and you got the peeled water. How are you going to react? Are you going to think, I can't believe that. They need to get their act together. They shouldn't be here. What, what kind of, we're, we're not that kind of church. Oh, are we not? As we should be the kind of church that when God does something new, our wineskin can handle it. We're able to go, you know what, bring them in. We're able to do whatever God wants to do. We need to be able to handle them. Do you remember your first time going to church? For some of us, we've been going our whole lives, not even thinking about it anymore. But try to put yourself in the position of someone who's never been. Does church seem all that inviting? What can you do in your church to make it seem more welcoming? Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. In today's message, Pastor Mark reminds us that while we can't let sin into the church, it's supposed to be a place for sinners like us. Think of it like a hospital. If everyone in the hospital pretended they were healthy and stopped any sick people from going there, then nobody would ever think they need healing. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Matthew chapter 9 with today's edition of Come to the Table. Grab your Bibles and open them up to Matthew chapter 9 as we get back into the book of Matthew. Now, again, today's entitled, uh, Seek and You Will Find. Again, remember Jesus said, Seek and You'll Find. Knock and the door will be open. Ask and it will be given. That's not even the passage we're in, but it so sums up where we are. That's why I entitled it this way, because this entire part of Matthew chapter 9 to the end is seeking the Lord and looking at the reward of those who seek the Lord. There is a great reward in seeking the Lord. As I said, maybe some of you have been seeking the Lord on something for a long time and you're wondering, why hasn't God done it? Maybe today is going to be your day. And we're going to see today that God has perfect timing for when he answers us, when we're crying out to him for what we're seeking. God knows what's best for us. His timing is always perfect and we can trust him. And so either way, whether he makes you wait longer or whether today is your day, you need to trust the Lord. Now, as we looked in chapter 9, uh, last time we saw that Jesus, again, healing the paralytic and then calling Matthew the tax collector. And really most of chapter 9 is healing all the way through. Uh, in this one instance, we're going to see one other thing he begins with here when it comes to how to seek the Lord. He deals with fasting. And then we'll go on into some of these other episodes of how to seek the Lord. But that's where we take up here in chapter 9, verse 14. And notice what it says. Then the disciples of John came to Jesus and said, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Now, again, understand why they would ask this question. Fasting in this day had become a tradition. It had become something that if you were a good Jewish uh, person, that's what you did. You fasted. And again, they would fast every Monday and Thursday. So fasting every Monday and Thursday showed how religious you were, how true you were, how devout you were. It was kind of a standard of, of righteousness. And so John's disciples, they saw that Jesus did not have his disciples fasting on Monday and Thursday. And they're like, what's going on? I mean, we fast every Monday and Thursday. Why aren't your disciples? And I'm sure their hearts were pure. They wanted to know what the right reason was. But they're wondering, why is it that we're doing all this fasting all the time? And we see you not only fasting, we see your disciples feasting. You know, I don't know about you guys. I don't like fasting. And if I had a choice, I'd rather feast than fast, right? But fasting is a good thing from time to time. You know that scripture that says Paul buffets his body? I read it this way. Paul buffets his body. Uh, you know, that's how I like to read that. But the bottom line is, is that I, I don't like to fast, but it's very healthy. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. Uh, but fasting again here was something that was more of a tradition. It wasn't done the right way. It wasn't done with the right heart. It was done in the sense of something religious. And like, Lord, how come your disciples are not being religious? Now, what is fasting all about? Fasting is a denial of 
our fleshly things. Now, when I say fleshly, I'm talking about there's fleshly and there's spiritual. Spiritual is all the things unseen. Fleshly is everything that we see now and everything that we're made out of. So whenever you fast, you're denying the things you enjoy down here in this body that you're in. And by denying that, you're lessening that uh, the, the fleshly part of you, and you can invest in the spiritual part by spending time in the Word and in prayer while you're denying your flesh, and you get closer to the Lord. It's something that God, you know, again, encourages us in. Again, Jesus, we're going to see, recommends that we do this. He'll give it the proper balance, and it's something we need to do from time to time as believers as we grow in the Lord. And so it's used that way, but it's also used oftentimes when there's mourning or heaviness or something that we're truly crying out to God for, some dire situation in our life. And again, it gets us, the idea is the same. It gets us in tune with the Spirit of God. And so they're saying, hey, how come your disciples are not getting as in tune with the Spirit of God as we are? Now, he'll explain that in just a moment, but understand this first. Fasting is not something that God requires anywhere in the Bible. There was only one place that God ever required a fast, and it was with the Jews in the Old Testament one time a year, and that was Yom Kippur. And that was one time a year, the high priest would go behind the veil where the Holy of Holies was, and he would bring an offering of blood, not for the individual people, but for the nation as a whole. And as he offered that blood for the nation, the rest of the nation was fasting, as it, on that one day only, as if to say, God, hear our prayer. We repent. Lord, forgive us. We know that we're not pure. We know that we sin, so cleanse us, Lord. Accept this offering. And that's the only time God required they fast because he wanted them to think about it, to think about their sin, to humble themselves, to repent. So God put that in there. And if, again, if there's anything fasting does, it gets you thinking, right? Mostly about burgers, but it gets you thinking, right? And so that's what fasting was all about. But they, in their attempt to look more spiritual, to look more holy, and maybe even in a right way wanting to be more spiritual, start adding more in there. So it's not wrong to fast more, but they made it a religion. They made it something you had to do. And the Lord now is going to use this as an opportunity to teach them that it's not about tradition. It's not about religion. It's about the heart. And notice what he says. They said, why don't your disciples fast? Jesus said, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? In other words, Jesus said, I'm the bridegroom. I'm the husband of my people. They're the bride of Christ. Now, they didn't fully understand that yet. But he's given this picture of husband and wife to the bride. He said, we're together. We're living life together. This is not a time to fast. It's a time to feast. He says, but the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast. He says, don't worry. There's going to be time when I die on the cross and I'm taken away. The church throughout history is going to have opportunity to fast. But while I'm here with them, we're going to rejoice. You know what that tells me? There's not going to be fasting in heaven, and I like that. There's going to be feasting in heaven. And so we're going to be just feasting with the Lord and rejoicing in the Lord and all these kind of things and just having a blast. But right now, there are grievous times, aren't there? There are times that we mourn. There are times we need to deny the flesh to hear the Spirit of God and to draw closer to God and do that. And they needed to understand that's the reason. It's not about tradition. It's about the reason you're doing it. And then the Lord goes beyond that because he says, you're asking about fasting, but I want to teach you about tradition. I want to expand you beyond tradition. I want you to be able to flow with the move of the Holy Spirit. Don't be so rigid that you only do what your denomination does or your non-denomination does or your group does, whoever they are. Be open to the flow and move of the Spirit. That's going to be the thrust of the rest of these few verses in this section. And notice what he says. He gives two examples. He says, no one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment for the patch pulls away and the garment uh, from the garment and the tear is made worse. Now, again, we have pre-shrunk, you know, materials now. You buy your jeans oftentimes pre-shrunk. And, uh, you know, I know when I was younger, you got your jeans and you're kind of bummed when they got a hole in them. Now you can charge more money for it, all right? So they're more valuable, the more holes they have. They make them with holes in them, right? And then they charge you more for it. But the bottom line is we pre-shrink our clothes, right? They didn't do that in that day. They didn't know how to do that. They would naturally just get shrunk over time as they washed their clothes over and over and over. And then what would happen is if you got a tear in your garment, they all knew this, you would have to get an older piece of garment and put it to it, something that already had, 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 had shrunk and wasn't going to change anymore because if you went and bought a brand new patch and put it on there, it would shrink and pull the rest of your garment and make the tear worse. So he's saying you've got to be flexible. You've got to be able to move with the garment, so to speak. He goes on to give another example. Look what he said. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Now, a couple things. Let's break this up in two sections. First of all, the wineskins, and then we'll talk about the wine. 
the wineskins were simply animals that they took and made a wineskin out of. And oftentimes they would simply keep the animal as it was. They would clean the animal, tan it, do all that they do for that to prepare it, tie the legs together, tie the neck together, and you put the fluid in it and just tie that neck up and it was used like a canteen. You'd throw it over your shoulder and carry it with you, whatever the case might be. The problem is over time, they would get hard. They're made of, of animal leather, so to speak. And, and so they would get hard and they would became unflexible. It's just like old leather that you have that won't move anymore. Well, here's the situation. If you have wine that's already fermented, it's older wine. And wine goes through a fermenting process as it matures. If it's already fermented, it's not going to give off all these gases. But if it's brand new wine that's just been made, it gives off these gases in the fermentation process. So what he's saying is, if you take the new wine and you put it in an old wine skin, what happens? Right? It's going to pop because you pour it in there. It can't as, as the gases begin to expand, it explodes. But if you take a wine skin that's flexible and you put the new wine skin in it so that it can move as things expand and maybe unexpected things begin to happen, not only will it not pop, it will preserve your wine and you'll be able to keep your wine and use it when you're ready to use it. Here's the whole point in all this. He's saying to them and to us today, the church, be flexible to the move of my spirit. If you become rigid to when I pour something new out in the body of Christ, if you're not flexible, you're not going to be able to handle it. How many of you came out of maybe a, an older church or, or older denomination or older non-denomination? I don't want to single this out either way. And they do things a certain way. That's just how they've always done it. And you try to do something new in that fellowship, what happens? Everybody has a fit. We don't do things like that here. We don't allow that here. That's a church that is inflexible. That's a church that can't move. That's the reason Jesus went outside of the rigid move of the Pharisees and Sadducees and started a brand new movement. He was pouring new wine, a new work, a new covenant, a new spirit working among the people. And the old covenant, the old spirit, they couldn't handle it. And so he said, you've got to be flexible. And guys, listen. We need to pray to be flexible here at Calvary Chapel. Now, that doesn't mean you let things in that are sinful. That doesn't mean you approve of sin. No, you hold the fort. You stay true to God's word. But if God is doing something new, don't fight it. I'll give you a couple of examples. Look at what happened in the 60s with the hippies. They were coming into the churches. They were coming in barefoot, carrying their, you know, surfboards. Um, you know, their hair was long. And everybody was in the church going, these guys need to cut their hair. They need to put shoes on. They're getting sand everywhere. And the bottom line was God was doing a brand new work, bringing them in, saying, I love you. Come on in and let God work once they get in there. God will take care of everything else. And much of the church back in the 60s, if you go and look at history, they were pushing them away. They're saying, you can't come here till you cut your hair. You can't come here till you change those clothes. You can't come here till you put away that surfboard or whatever the case might be from bringing it into church because they literally brought them in and sat on them. I mean, this was, it was quite the move that God was doing and these kids coming right off the beaches, so to speak. But there were those churches that were open saying, you know what, we'll take you. And again, that's where a lot of the Calvary Chapel pastors came from, actually. A lot of these old hippies that came in and did that. But what if God did something similar today? All right, now you look around. Okay, we kind of can predict what kind of crowd we're going to have at Calvary Chapel any Sunday morning, right? What happens if God pours out his spirit, let's say, on the, on the Gothic group here in Knoxville? Those that were all the black leather, they pierce everything that can be pierced. They have a tattoo anywhere you can tattoo. And I'm not judging for that. I'm simply describing the situation. God pours out his spirit on them. And they just start getting saved. They're going, you know what? I, we want to go to church. How many churches would they feel comfortable going to? Now, what if they felt comfortable coming here? I hope they would. And what if they start sitting right now in all these places where you guys are? You don't have, they're sitting right between you. You got the guy, you know, with the hair like this, you know, and you got the people. Water. How are you going to react? Are you going to think, I can't believe that. They need to get their act together. They shouldn't be here. What, what kind of, we're, we're not that kind of church. Oh, are we not? Guys, we should be the kind of church that when God does something new, our wineskin can handle it. We're able to go, you know what? Bring them in. We're able to do whatever God wants to do. We need to be able to handle them. And that's something we need to pray about. We need to be able to do that. Again, not making the mistake of allowing sin. There's a difference. But having the door open for sinners like us so they can see the love of the Lord and be ministered to. That's what Jesus was teaching them. That's why they're not fasting. Because there's something new that I'm doing. You don't understand it yet, but you will understand it later. And that's something we need to understand as believers. And notice, while he spoke these things, you're going to see all these things flowing one to another at these different times of seeking. What was the first way we can seek the Lord? Through fasting. By the way, is it okay to fast today? I want to mention that real quick. Yes. You can fast. You can fast food. You can fast drink. You can fast maybe at TV shows or movies or whatever. There's different things to fast. But you want to just set, and maybe everything at some point in your life, but it's healthy to do. It gets you in tune with the Spirit. 
And so he says here in verse 18, while he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshiped him saying, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. He had the faith to believe that if Jesus touched his daughter, his daughter would live. Now we have to unpack this a little bit because who is this ruler? Here's how it worked. In that day, the synagogues had 10 elders at each synagogue and they had a chief elder Okay, maybe the senior elder, maybe a way to kind of think about that today is if we had 10 elders here and you have a senior pastor. And so the Pharisees were already giving everyone a hard time about Jesus saying, watch out for this rabbi. They hadn't yet completely kicked him out yet, but they're saying, watch out for this rabbi. He was becoming, a, uh, you know, spoken of badly among them and people were kind of, crowds were following him, but it wasn't in good sight with the Sadducees and Pharisees. Here's a leader of the synagogue and his daughter now is dying. And you know what? He doesn't care what anybody thinks. My daughter's dying. You know, those of you that have daughters or, or are sons, if something goes wrong with your kids, you'll do anything to try to save them, anything to spare them. That's what this man is. He's in despair. And he's like, I'll do anything to save my daughter. I don't care what the church thinks about me in the synagogue. I don't care what the Pharisees and Sadducees think about me. I need Jesus, and I'm going to do whatever I can to seek him. And this would have made quite the stir for the ruler. He's the main leader of the church, doing something that the religious community said was a no-no. But he doesn't care. He wants Jesus. And again, desperation does that to us. It drives us to the Lord, which is a good thing. And notice it says, my daughter has just died. It tells us in another gospel, she was 12 years old. Now that's gonna be key in a moment because we're gonna see a woman that interrupts this scene with a flow of blood for 12 years. We'll see why that's significant in just a moment. But his daughter's died. He says, so Jesus arose and followed him and so did his disciples. So this, everybody's going, you know, the, the, the murmur's happening. That's the ruler of the synagogue. He came for Jesus. They're going to his daughter. She's dying. She's on the edge of death, it tells us in another gospel. Now, it also tells us that while they're walking, we're gonna see here in this scene that this woman comes up and it tells us while he's dealing with this woman, somebody else comes to him and says, no need to come. Your daughter's already died. Now imagine what this Jairus, his name is Jairus. Again, another gospel tells us his name. He just wants to get to his daughter. Look what happens. Suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years, like his 12-year-old daughter, uh, she didn't have the flow of blood, but this lady did, came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. Now there's several things to note here. First of all, again, they're trying to get to Jairus' house and this woman comes and interrupts everything and stops it. Jairus is probably no doubt thinking, Lord, we don't have time for this. You can deal with her later. My daughter's on the edge of death. And you can imagine the despair that while, while this scene is going on, and another, another gospel tells us, they came up and said to him, she's dead. Don't even worry about it. We'll see what, how he reacts to that in just a moment. But this woman had a flow of blood. Now, we don't know what the flow of blood was. Again, uh, here's the bottom line. In the Levitical law, if you had a flow of blood, you were unclean. And in the essence, you were considered almost dead, if not dead. Why? You couldn't touch anything. No one could touch you. You couldn't be around your family. You couldn't go to synagogue. You couldn't go to temple. You were Levitically unclean during that flow. Even women during their normal cycle, they were unclean and couldn't go to church during that time. Imagine her, her whole life was that way. Levitically, she couldn't be a part of the community. She couldn't be a part of her family. She couldn't do anything. She's desperate. It tells us in another gospel, she had spent everything she had on doctors and nobody did her any good. And now she hears about this rabbi, this traveling rabbi who's healing, you know, giving sight to the blind, the deaf are hearing, the dead are being raised. All these things she's hearing about this Messiah or this, or this rabbi. I don't know if she knew he was the Messiah yet or not. And so she seeks him out. Just like Jairus in his despair, she now has her despair and nothing is gonna keep her from Jesus. She's going to get to the Lord. And why do I say nothing's gonna keep her from getting there? Because again, another gospel tells us that the crowds were so bad and the crowds were so thick that you couldn't even get to the Lord. I mean, everybody was crowded around him. It tells us in another gospel when this happened, that, that when she touches him, Jesus said, who touched me? And they say to him, Lord, everybody's touching you. What do you mean you touched you? They, they're all touching you. No, he said, I felt power go out of me. Someone was really seeking with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, and I felt it. My power went to them, and I want to know who it is. And she's going to reveal herself as to who she is in just a moment. But it's amazing when you think about what she had to go through. First of all, before I get to that, notice the 12 years. Why is this important here? Jairus' daughter, 12 years old. The woman, 12 years of flow of blood. The number 12 in Scripture is the number of God's perfect government. Or we might say God's perfect order. God's perfect control, God's perfect timing, if you will. And why is that so important? Because God allowed these things to happen 
when they did, and especially with the woman with the flow of blood, he allowed her cries for 12 years. He allowed all the doctors for 12 years. Not that he wanted her to suffer, but God has a perfect time that he wants to answer our prayers because he knows when the perfect time is. And some of you this morning, you've been waiting a long time. You've been praying maybe 12 years, maybe longer than 12 years. And God says, I've heard your prayer. Don't worry, it's not time. And when it's time, I will move. God answers yes, maybe, and no. He answers, that's how he answers prayer. Yes, no, and maybe. And if God is saying yes and it hasn't happened yet, don't stop seeking. Keep crying, keep praying. In God's perfect timing, he will do it. We just have to learn to wait. This was her moment. This was her moment. This was her time. And again, I think about her trying to get to the Lord. There's such a scene here. Now picture all the crowd in your mind. Picture her trying to get to Jesus. First of all, she has to defile everyone she touches before she gets to him. Wow. She realizes, I'm going to Levitically defile everyone working through this crowd, but I've got to get to Jesus. How bad do you want to get to Jesus? I'm not saying you should defile people in doing it. (laughs) But in her situation under the Levitical law, that was her only option. And imagine her fighting her way through. And then when she got up to the Lord, guess what she had to do? Notice it says she touched the hem of his garment, which means she had to bend down in that crowd, reach through and touch the hem of his garment. Now, why would she touch the hem of his garment, not just try to touch the top? Understand this. The law said that all the Jewish men were to wear tassels on the corners of their robes. And in the tassels, they had this blue strand in each of the tassels. And that blue strand represented the word of God. And it was to always be a reminder, I'm walking in the word of God. Everyone's seeing the word of God. You'd remember the promises of God. You'd always think about the word of God, that God is faithful, that God is ever present, that God is always there, that his word is always among us. And her thought was this, if I can just touch this symbol, if I can touch the word of God through Jesus, I know that it'll heal me. And guys, the same is true for you this morning. As God is speaking his word to you this morning, if you grab a hold of his promises, Grab a hold of his word through Jesus Christ. He will meet you this morning. For those who seek, he's there. And I love the fact that he felt the power going out of him when this happened. And I was thinking about her bending down, you know, reaching through the crowd to get to him. Uh, when I was in Israel a while back by the Sea of Galilee, that sounds, that sounds, that kind of sounds like bragging. Well, I was in Israel a while back. I'm not bragging. Uh, that just sounded kind of, I don't know, whatever. Uh, but we go to, you used to go to Israel on regular trips, and we hadn't been there in a long time. But I walked into this church that's there on the Sea of Galilee, and there's this beautiful mural there. I want you guys to see it. Put the picture up. This is that mural that's there in in, in that. Look at this. This is a a, a picture of what it would have been like, all the people there, and this hand comes through among this crowd and all these feet just to touch the hem of his garment. I kind of wish it was grabbing the tassel, uh, but either way, it's, it's a great picture there. Imagine what she went through to do that. Imagine what she had to do, how she was pushed around and kicked around. Suddenly power goes out of the Lord, fills her with, you know, uh, the the spirit. She's healed of her flow of blood. And the Lord says, who touched me? Lord, everyone's touching you. He turns around. She could have easily hidden in the crowd and backed away and said, I don't want anyone to see me. I don't want them to know what happened. They'll know that I've defiled them, et cetera, whatever they would have known about her. But it says she came forward in boldness and said, Lord, it was I. Thanks for joining us as we come to the table of God's Word with Pastor Mark Kirk. In this series, Pastor Mark is teaching from the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44 says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Do you remember the day you discovered the kingdom of heaven when Jesus first called your name? Just like the disciples who dropped everything to follow him, you were ready right then to give up everything else in your life to be with Jesus. As Pastor Mark goes through Matthew in this series, think back to that first love and let the flame be rekindled. Put yourself into the story and drop your nets to follow the teacher who performs miracles and then sit at his feet and learn how to love. We're so glad you've decided to join us for this series. There's nothing greater than spending time together at the feet of our Lord. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry out of Calvary, Knoxville. If you're in the Knoxville, Tennessee area, we'd love to see you in person. We have services on Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 9.30 and 11.15 a.m., and Wednesday nights at 7. You can find our location at calvaryknoxville.org. And if you can't make it in person, You can find all sorts of messages available at thewaymedia.net or just download the Way Media app. 
Well, we've come to the end of our time together for today. But Pastor Mark has much more to share as we go through the book of Matthew. So make sure to join us the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.